Um, tonight's book that we'll be discussing is Getting Back to Full Employment, and it is available for sale in our independent bookstore right outside for $5. So uh, after the discussion and after the question and answer period, um, there will be some book signings, so you all can just pop out and get your book. Um, now I'll pass the program over to Shashi. Uh, actually, let me say a few uh, words of introduction just uh, to uh, get us started. Um, I uh, asked my uh, colleague from the Center on Budget Policy Priorities, Chai Ching Tong, to uh, uh, treat this war as an interview uh, in the hopes that uh, it would force Dean and I to be crisper in our uh, answers. We can, we can be off and running for 40 minutes on one question, and we don't want to do that. Uh, so thank you, Chai Ching, for uh, agreeing to do so. And uh, I know we're going to leave time for Q and A, right? Yeah. Or at least Q. Um, and, uh, uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone for coming. I'm sure Dean does as well. Uh, Most of I, I just saw, yeah, I just saw uh, Pat Watson, who edited the book. And so, Pat, great to, to see you. And I see Larry Michelle there, and uh, he sort of began us all. So it's nice to. He was both of our bosses. Yeah. So it's nice to have. I'm Larry then. So without further ado, uh, we turn things over to uh, Chai Ching. Fantastic. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here to try to wrangle these two um, economic heavyweights this evening. So uh, as you probably already know, Dean Baker, co-founder and co-director of the uh, Centre for Economic Policy and Research, and Jared Bernstein, Senior Fellow at the Centre on Budget and Policy Priorities. And both of them have long and illustrious, many, many titles, many books, many um, exciting things in their past, so this is going to be very exciting. Now, uh, I do uh, want to mention that we have a hashtag running. Um, hashtag is full employment, so if you have questions that you want to send to that, we'll probably get around to those towards the end, if we have time for Q, at least Q. <laughs> and, if you don't already know about it, if you're interested in these sorts of issues and this is the sort of thing you like to spend a lot of time thinking about, um, both these guys have fantastic blogs that you can follow on this sort of thing. Jared is at On The Economy and Dean is at uh, Beat The Press. Um, both of them also great Twitter feeds, um, absolutely uh, compulsory reading if you want to keep in touch with these sorts of issues. So um, I think a pretty, pretty basic question to start off with, what is this thing, Dean, that you call full employment? Is this something that other economists recognize as well? Is there a rate that you're aiming for? Well, it's what a, it? It, it is a very good question. We've had a lot of people ask us, and we actually wrote a blog post on this uh, a couple, about a week ago in the Times, saying, you know, what our definition was of full employment. And, you know, in, invariably, we're going to be somewhat fuzzy on this, but we, we decided we're going to throw out a number. We threw out 4%, and the logic here was, we saw, you know, back in the late 90s, well, in fact, 2000, we had 4% as a year-round average rate of unemployment. And we think that's a reasonable target to shoot for in the sense that that's a, a level of unemployment consistent with most people having jobs. We understand even there, there's going to be people that don't have jobs, people will be between jobs to some extent. And also, people, you will have people that, you know, structural reasons they are unemployed, and that's a more difficult problem. We don't want to neglect anyone, but the point is that's what's a reasonable target. And looking at 4% unemployment, if we look back to 2000, we see that the inflation rate during that period was relatively stable, and that's what economists traditionally look at. Um, they have the concept of non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, NARU, the lowest rate of unemployment that's consistent with the stable inflation rate. And what we actually saw was that in that period, looks like 4% pretty much fit the bill because we had unemployment at that level for a long period of time and the inflation rate was pretty much stable. So that's what we think is a reasonable target. That's lower than most economists will say. But, you know, we recognize that and the, the points we made in that blog and we make in the book is uh, back in the 90s, uh, no one thought you can get to 4% unemployment either. And, you know, it was really through kind of a quirk that you had Alan Greenspan, who was certainly a non-conventional non economist, who was the chair of the Fed. And I, I criticized Greenspan on many, many things, but the one thing I give him enormous credit for was because he was a non-conventional economist, when people were pressing him to raise interest rates to keep the unemployment rate from falling lower, he said, I don't see any inflation, why should I raise interest rates? So he let the unemployment rate fall in a context where no one else probably would have. And as a result of that, we had this golden age in the late 90s where we had the unemployment rate fall lower than anyone thought it could. And we had widespread wage growth up and down the, the wage ladder. So 
that's what we want to see the, the, the policy, you know, the Fed policymakers shoot for, and that's why we're holding it out there. So, Jared, Dean's mentioned a couple of times the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, has this happened before? How often does it happen that we get to full employment? Well, uh, I actually had some slides on this, but it turns out that it was sort of awkward to try to use them up here. So um, I have some pictures I commend to you uh, 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 that uh, refer to some, that I'll refer to in my answer, and they're on my blog, jaredbrunstyblog.com, um, in, in a post I put up today called something like pictures of pictures of the neighbor or pictures of something or other. I don't remember exactly the title. Um, the answer is that full employment has actually been uh, the exception, not the norm. Uh, for the last few decades. And it's one of the reasons why we're uh, stuck with the kind of inequality problem that um, all of us uh, up here on the stage, including yourself, uh, write about and, uh, and worry about. Uh, one of the uh, ways to uh, uh, make that case is if you think about the period, uh, say, from the late 40s to now, and if you actually track income growth from the late 40s to uh, most recently, uh, and you look at low, middle, and high income families, you'll find that incomes grew together, low, middle, and high, all just about doubled from the mid-40s to the mid-70s. So that was really a growing together period. Then there's a growing apart period, which is since then, and that, that the great divergence with high incomes taking off, middle, flat, bottom, falling. And uh, at the same time, if you look at when the unemployment rate was Love when the job market uh, was closer to full employment, you'll find that that was much more the case in that earlier period relative to the, to the latter period. So pre, say, 1979, the unemployment rate was below the Nehru, so it was lower than this full employment rate consistent with stable inflation. So the unemployment rate was below the Nehru um, like about 70% of the time. If you look at all the quarters and you sort of tote them up, 70% of the time, the unemployment rate was actually below the neighborhood from 49 to 79. 70% precisely the same. 70% of the time uh, from 79 to 2013, it was above the neighborhood. So uh, the answer to your question is that full employment has actually been a rarity uh, over the last 30 years, the very period when inequality has accelerated. I'm not saying that by any means that's the only factor responsible, but neither is it a coincidence. So you mentioned an inequality being something that might correlate with full employment. Right. Uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, did in the book, and I, 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 uh, we've seen, I've seen this with British data. I haven't seen it yet with, uh, with US data, though I apologize if there are people in the room who have done just that. I often find, I think I did something for the first time and 14 other people did it first, um, is we, we uh, built a data set, and by the way, John Schmidt, I don't know if John's here, but John Schmidt was very helpful in some of this analysis. We thank him in the acknowledgments. Um, we built a database of wage trends by state over time. So we had something like 1,500 observations of wage values, real wage values over 51 states, 50 states plus DC. And so we were able to get at this uh, question of the impact of full employment on wages at different parts of the wage scale. And what we show, and this is one of the more, I think, if I had to pick one graph out of, book, out of the book that's most important, I'd probably pick this one. I think it's 2.4, but I'm not sure. Um, I should actually look at the book here. Um, we show that the impact of lower unemployment is most helpful to people in the bottom of the wave scale, moderately helpful to people in the middle, and really doesn't do much for people at the top. And if you think about it, that pushes exactly the opposite way of the other factors that have been generating more inequality. The absence of full employment, globalization, technology, the absence of unions, low minimum wages, all the things that we tick off that um, help to generate higher inequality, full employment pushes the opposite direction. It delivers its benefits most powerfully to those at the bottom of the scale, helps those in the middle, does very little for those at the top. That's the wage effect. There's an hours effect that's equally powerful. If so I could just make a, one more point of that, that, that's really the point of the cover of the book. So if you're wondering why we have sprawl mark $15 an hour plus benefits, if you go back to the late 60s, in 68, we often point to that that was a high mark for the minimum wage. We're all talking about raising the minimum wage back to $10 an hour, which is where it would be today if you adjusted for inflation. Now, if you adjusted for productivity, it would be around $17 an hour. 
And what's striking is, I don't believe that you know we could just raise the minimum wage and get to 17 bucks an hour and not have some employment effect. The point making with that is that we had a minimum wage that was the equivalent of $17 an hour relative to the productivity of the economy at that time. And we had very low unemployment because we had a very different type of economy. And if we had a type of economy where we have high employment, then Walmart would have to pay 15, 16 bucks an hour to get workers. So that's partly the point here, that if we really have the type of economy we want to see, um, minimum wage is great, so I'm not denigrating that. You know, very important to raise the minimum wage. But that by itself is not going to get us workers working at a living wage where they could support their families. So I'm getting a pretty good sense of why this is a really important concept, and particularly for low-income people. One of the things I was really struck by in the book was that you, you discussed some of the long-term impacts of unemployment that people at the bottom are starting to see. Do you want to mention a couple of those and, and how that relates to full employment? Sure. Um, and by the way, it's, it's figure 2.7. I just looked it up. It's the one that I was trying to think of. Um, well, actually, two things come to mind. One we wrote about in the book. One has actually kind of been um, uh, come out more recently. Um, let me speak about that one first. <clears throat> There's this problem in an economy that runs uh, with so much slack in it for so long. Um, economists have given it the title hysteresis which um, sounds like a terrible disease, and in many ways it is a terrible disease, but um, <clears throat> it's, it's an economic one. And what it's basically saying is that when you have a, a business a cycle problem like we've had where demand collapses, <clears throat> macro economy goes south and you have high unemployment, uh, if that lasts long enough, cyclical can morph into structural. Meaning that problems that you're having on the unemployment side can last long enough such that uh, 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 the potential uh, growth rate in the economy can actually come down. And there have recently been numerous economists, Larry Summers gave a notable talk on this the other day, who are suggesting that this is a real possibility. Uh, where Chai Ching is coming from in that regard is the fact that we've never had as much long-term unemployment as we've had in this downturn. We still have a far larger share of the unemployment, I think, uh, of the unemployed who are, who, who are who have been jobless for at least half a year. I think it's up around 35, 38 percent, something like that. It's been a, as high as 45 percent. So at least it's coming down. So it's still way too high. And that uh, problem is not necessarily one that goes away uh, in, in, uh, quickly. Uh, when demand returns, um, if, uh, if it continues to persist. The other thing we talked about, and this is in the book, is that there are uh, uh, lasting problems from the kinds of unemployment rates that we've been posting for such a long time now. If you're uh, unfortunate enough to start your career in a down economy, it affects the whole age uh, wage trajectory. That is, it, it, uh, it has a negative impact on your wage trajectory throughout your whole career just by, by dint of starting out at a time like this. Um, it's associated with, with some non-economic factor, not obviously economic factor. We talk about wage and hours and unemployment. It's associated with divorce rates and illness and less mobility and things like that. So uh, uh, these problems run deep. Just a couple points that jump in on that. Um, one is that you know when most people leave long-term unemployment, they actually aren't getting jobs. Of course, most of these people just drop out of the labor force, and you know there's sort of something that you know some conservative economist Casey Mulligan likes to tell the story. At uh, times, the blogger opposite Jared likes to tell the story. Well, the reason we have so many people unemployed is we extended unemployment benefits. There's a bit of truth to that. People stay unemployed because in order to get benefits, they have to continue to look for work. And there's been some very good research that shows, okay, so what happens when you hit that end point, whether it's 97 weeks, 52 weeks, whatever it is, what happens when you hit that end point? The overwhelming majority of people don't suddenly go, oh, I'll go out and work now. What they go is go, okay, well, I guess there's no jobs out there. I stop looking. So, in fact, the problem of long-term unemployment is much, much worse than what's indicated by the percentage of the workforce that's long-term unemployed, which, as Jared said, is at record highs. The other point is that this also is a generational story. So sometimes we hear people saying that, you know, we have to get the budget deficits now because we care about our children. Well, it's a little warped view here because a lot of those children are being raised by parents who aren't employed. And there's research that shows, and again, it should be a surprising story, that kids of unemployed parents don't do as well in school, don't do as well in their careers. Well, why? Because their parents can't afford to care for them properly. Okay, so it's hardly a surprising story. So it's a long-term story. It's also, as a short-term story, it's also a long-term story. 
So we know it's important, we know we don't have it at the moment, we know that there's a lot of cyclical stuff happening at the moment, but why is it so rare? Being, is, it, is this the case in other countries? Why, why is it sort of like twice in the last, you know? Well, I think, I think that's a very interesting story, and I don't think there's a similar answer to it, because I think we had a political consensus for full employment in the decades immediately following World War II. That was really, you know, throughout, you know, the United States, West Europe, you had much more unemployment rates, you know, really throughout the Western world in the decades, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s. Then we had this bout of inflation, and we really had a qualitatively ch qualitative change um, obviously in economic policy, but I think also in the politics behind it. So I think it became more acceptable to have higher rates of unemployment, the idea being that, oh my God, the inflation in the 70s was awful. We don't want that again. So I think it was kind of a response to that. And there, there's, of course, political forces behind that. So in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, you had, you know, if you looked at the U.S. and, you know, we're sitting here and go, who's the big powers in the United States? Well, we'd all be saying General Motors, U.S. Steel, you know, and people would be laughing at us today if we said that. You know, it's a very, very different economy today. Certainly finance has far more importance in the economy today than was true 30 years ago. And finance bears a very different relationship to, to you know, the overall economy. If, if you, you know, we had, we we're talking, we had the executive General Motors in the room, you know, back 40, 50 years ago. They were, you know, they had the idea that, you know, when the economy was strong, they stood to sell more cars. So they had a very direct benefit from that. Um, J.P. Morgan, you know, they're, they're doing fine now. I don't know, you know, if we got the unemployment rate down to 4% whether they ever any reason to think they would do better. So I think there's very different political coalition um, in control of politics today than was true, say, in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s. I'd like to speak to that, too, because it's a great, it's, it's a very important question. It begins to get a little bit into the politics of full employment, which, I mean, we're in D.C., so we've got to talk about politics, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's important to think about why, uh, especially in this town, you know, you've got lots of people, less so now, but for years, lots of people running around with their hair on fire about the budget deficit, nobody really seemed to be particularly worried about the absence of full employment. Um, I think one of the things Dean just spoke about is worth amplifying uh, further. Um, I, I call it sectoral, I don't know if I call it this, but I think it's called, <laughs> uh, sectoral misallocation. That is, when you devote a lot of your economic resources to a sector within the economy that is not generating the kind of productivity or job growth, and in fact is generating the kind of bubbles that hurt you, um, you've got an obvious problem, both in terms of, uh, of, of the absence of full employment, and I'm thinking, of course, of finance. Um, uh, finance has become a much larger share of the economy relative to, say, manufacturing. Um, uh, and, and, and so the, the allocation of resources into that sector uh, is, I think, one of the reasons why we face unique levels of stagnation in the 2000s. Remember, the 1990s, as we've said, there was a bubble there as well, and Dean's Dean written a lot about that. The 1990s, we did achieve a full employment economy by the latter half, so things weren't all that different in terms of technology and globalization. With the 2000s, we had a level of sectoral misallocation that I think uh, contributed to the problem. And then secondly, I do think that there is a, um, a, a, a growing sense, this is not at all a surprise, let me be brief here, because everybody probably either agrees with this or disagrees with it, but I don't need to say much about it. There is a, an, an increasing sense that government um, is not the solution uh, to whatever problem you have. And, and so, the notion uh, at a time like at a time like this, and we'll get to our solutions in a second. But at a time like this, you know, we believe there's very much a role for government intervention to help put us on this path back to full employment. I would argue that that are, uh, making that case is is tougher now for political reasons than it's been in the past. You mentioned a little bit of over focus, you think, on deficit reduction rather than full employment. But but surely if we just you know, reduce deficits, fix the debt, we'll have employment coming out of our ears. <laughs> um, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that's amazing, at least to me, I and mean, will speak for himself, on this, I don't even know what their story is at this point. You know, we, we all could be wrong in the sense, you know, it's even possible for Jared and I to be wrong. <laughs> um, you know, but, but we could be wrong, but we have a story. You know, so, so Jared and I want 
to spend lots of money on infrastructure. You know, we have our list of things, read the book, you know, and maybe it'll turn out that there'll be some reason why that doesn't work. But we could tell you why it would work, you know, okay, so you hire people. That seems to create jobs, you know, on the face of it. I mean, at least I think we would. And again, there could be a reason why it would be proven wrong. You could lose jobs elsewhere. I mean, that's at least possible. We could tell you a story. So you go, okay, so we have our fixed the debt friends here, and maybe we don't get them here. But let's say we did, you know, get the deficit down, you know, show the financial. So, so what is that going to do? And, you know, implicitly there's some idea, and I'm putting words in their mouths, but I, you know, I've heard things like this from them that you know, financial markets will be more confident, businesses will be more confident. Well, it's a little hard to see that, and we've had the opportunity to try that. So you've had, you know, you don't talk about doing natural experiments, you know, if we were all scientists, natural scientists would get our petri dishes, and do, you, you can't really do that with an economy, but you did have governments, most obviously the government in the UK, a country that's not all that different from the United States, where they said, we're going to go the route of austerity. They raised taxes, they cut spending, get the confidence of financial markets. Well, it hasn't worked. They went into a recession, their economy, I mean, they're touting their economy is finally growing after two years of recession, three years of recession or near stagnation, but it hasn't worked. So what is the story? So the story was supposed to be interest rates would fall. Our interest rates are about as low as they could possibly be anyhow. Um, and then businesses would have more confidence and then they would go out and invest. Well, they tried that in the UK. Businesses didn't run out and invest for the obvious reason. Most businesses invest when they see demand, and they're not seeing it when you're going through through austerity because you're you're reducing demand. So, you know, they don't. It, it's not. I mean, again, I would be happy to argue against their story if I saw a story there, but I don't even see it. So, uh, great. We cause a lot of pain in the short term, and we all understand that that sometimes could be worthwhile if that's clearly how you. You know, benefit in the long term. We've all had that experience. You know, do things you don't like, and you'll get something you'll, you'll get from it. You know, Jared and I studied a lot of economics. We probably found boring at times, but you know, it was worth doing. Uh, maybe it wasn't worth doing, but in any case, you know, we can understand that in principle. But in this case, it just looks like short-term pain. The price is longer-term pain. I, uh, I, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I, I am, um, you know, I probably am more of a. Uh, uh, a CDSH than, than, than Dean and, and maybe even others in the room. That's an acronym, uh, not a very mellifluous one that, that I made up. Um, cyclical Dove Structural Hawk, CDSH. It's not that I don't think there's a time for uh, deficit reduction. As a card-carrying member of the uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, like you, um, I think we have uh, well-deserved and, and well-earned street cred in terms of fiscal responsibility. It's the um, absolutely dismal, and here is where I completely agree with, with Dean, and um, I commend to you chapter four in the book, which Dean took the lead on, uh, on these points. Uh, it's, it's absolutely um, uh, destructive to um, be a, a cyclical hawk. You've got to be a cyclical dove. Um, when the economy is as weak as it is, the last thing you want to do is apply medieval leeching. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what is the motivation behind that? And again, I come back to the political. I think that the motivation is one of shrinking the hell out of government, whacking the hell out of social insurance. And the, uh, it, there was a time when it was, um, when, uh, there was a time when I think people on the left, actually somewhat strategically, were saying, you know, we're against budget deficits. If you go with the Bush tax cuts, you're going to have very large budget deficits. And that strategy kind of morphed into a, uh, an, an, an obsessive compulsion, what they call it, uh, deficit attention disorder. Um, <laughs> uh, and and, and, and with, with, you know, with, with a, a complete um, uh, ignoring of, of, of everything we, we talk about in the book. I mean, somebody once asked me on a radio show, you know, how would you describe Keynesian economics? And the thing that I said, I'm not saying this is profound, but the first thing that came to mind which it, it was dynamics. That, that uh, uh, Keynes introduced the idea of dynamics. There are times when you have to do this, and times when you stop doing this, and you have to do that. And I think that, as simple as it sounds, I think it, it actually is, is, is a profound insight that has been uh, willfully neglected by those who are, who are uh, really all about just, just shrinking government. So if the leeches are not the prescription to full employment right now, what is, what's, what's on your agenda? 
Well, I'll mention a, a couple things, and Jared could pick up uh, from there. Uh, one of the things I really think should be front and center, Jared and I had a piece about this a, a couple weeks ago, is, is getting the, the trade deficit down, and that really means getting the value of the dollar down. And the basic point about the trade deficit, and this is national income accounting. I don't know how many times I've raised it to people and they're going, where are you getting this from? And go, well, it's really any intro tax. You'll find it right at the beginning. You know, if we if we have a trade deficit, it's it's very simple. This is money that is creating demand overseas. It's not money that's creating demand here. So you and I, we're all getting our paychecks. We all have our income. And rather than spending it here at Busboy and Poet, we're spending it wherever, you know, somewhere overseas, which isn't to knock foreign trade or anything. The point is it's not creating demand here. Okay, so how do we make that up? Okay, well, you can make that up with a large budget deficit, but if that's not possible for political reasons, then it's very hard to tell a story where you're going to make that up. You get a lot of hand waving, oh, we're going to do it with investment. Well, really not. Look at the data. You're not going to do it with investment. Um, we could do it with the bubble. We did that with the, the stock bubble in the 90s. We did it with the housing bubble in the last decade. Uh, someone else wants to go that route, you know, I don't, that's not my recommendation. I mean, you can do it. I don't think it's, it doesn't end well, just put it that way. So getting the trade deficit down, which by the way, means getting the dollar down. We could all talk about improving trade policies, you know, we could talk about industrial policy, which I think there's a lot of things we could do. But seriously, if you get the dollar down 10, 15, 20 percent, that dwarfs anything. Give me your dream plan. That will dwarf the impact of your dream plan. How do we get the dollar down? How do we get the dollar down? <laughs> well, you know, part of that story, I mean, I, I love this, you, you say this, well, getting the dollar down, this is a matter, of, you know, China's often mentioned here, it's not just China, they're clearly the biggest actor. It's a matter of negotiating. You know, we, we have to, you know, say this is important for the United States, and, you know, we, we have all these trade deals, and we negotiate, we tell them you're going to respect our patents, you're going to respect our copyrights, you're going to give Goldman Sachs access to your markets. Well, if we say top, front and center on the list is we're going to have a lower value dollar, we could get that. Believe me, we could get that. So it's a question of political choice. And unfortunately, getting a lower dollar against the other currencies has not been front and center. Getting patent protection for Pfizer and Merck has been front and center. Getting increased copyright protection for Microsoft has been front and center. Getting access for the financial firms like Goldman Sachs, that's been front and center. So it's a question of prioritizing. We can get that. The second point I'll make is, you know, if you think for a moment, what's the problem we're facing now? And it's, all, it's really a perverse problem. It's not that we're poor. The problem is we're rich. And that might sound crazy given how many people are poor. Well, the problem is we could produce too much. Okay, that's why we have people unemployed. We don't need them. We can produce everything we need, everything that people are buying without you. Well, our response, or one response, and arguably the best response is, well, let's increase demand. But if for whatever reason that's not possible, you can go the other route, decrease supply. And the great model here is Germany. A lot of people point to Germany and they go, oh, Germany's had a big boom. And when someone tells you that, they're telling you they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Germany's growth since the beginning of the downturn has been almost identical to the growth in the United States. Their unemployment rate went from 7.8% back in 2007 to 5.2% today. Ours went from 4.5 to 7.3. Why did ours go up and theirs go down even though growth's been the same? Well, there's a little bit demographic, sir. But the main thing is that they get people to work shorter hours. They have firms that keep, people work, people, keep workers on the payroll, have them work shorter hours rather than lay them off. And to my view, that would be a great, great thing. And you know, to some extent, that might sound like we're redistributing unemployment. That's partly true. But part of this takes the form in Germany. Everyone gets six weeks a year paid vacation. They're paid parentally. They're paid sick days. These are things that we should be looking to do because they're good in their own right. They also have good environmental effects, if anyone gives a damn about global warming. But you know, they have a lot of good effects, and they also have the ability to keep people at work. So again, there's lots of things we do actually need, so we should be looking to increase demand. But if, for a variety of reasons, that might not be possible politically, we should also be looking to decrease supply. So let me pick up on this. And, and the, this is actually Dean and, and my second book on uh, full employment. And the first one, um, which we wrote when we were both at EPI, uh, that was written when the unemployment rate was really low, and this one was when the unemployment was really high. So the first one was kind of like, look at all these great benefits of full employment. And the second one is, Look at all these benefits we're missing from not being at full employment. Uh, and in this one, though, I thought in the last one we didn't pay enough attention to this question of the path back. 
And this one we really, we really did. We devoted a couple of chapters to it. And we basically came up with uh, five ideas. And I'm just going to tick them off. Dean's talked about a couple of them, so I don't, I don't have to say more about them. Uh, work sharing, which is uh, what, what Dean was just talking about. By the way, that is the law of the land. Um, this is underappreciated. Uh, the Obama administration um, uh, uh, signed a law, Congress passed it, it's hard to imagine, but they did a few years ago, um, uh, encouraging uh, states to uh, use work sharing as part of their unemployment insurance toolkit. Um, Which 26 states have, by the way, yeah. including California and New York, so these aren't small North Dakota states. Work sharing, the trade deficit which Dean just talked about. By the way, there, there are in our, in our, uh, we did an op-ed in the New York Times about this a few weeks ago called uh, We're Targeting the Wrong Deficit, something like that. And in there we, all, we, we actually offer, uh, along with what Dean said, three different ways that you could um, uh, 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 offset these currency interventions that uh, keep the dollar artificially high relative to other countries' currencies. And I know they must be right, because they all came from Josh Bivens. He told me about them. He's in the audience, and he's uh, one of the smartest macroeconomists I know. So, uh, so there's that. Um, uh, direct job creation. Okay, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, infrastructure investment. Don't need to talk about that. And we can during Q&A. We can be more specific. And then fiscal and monetary policy. So let me just say a little bit about three and five. Direct job creation and, and fiscal and mon. Um, it is not a controversial statement to aver that the uh, Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort in a credit crunch. Um, I'd like it to be uh, equally uh, um, uh, well accepted to say that when the market fails to provide a quantity uh, or quality of employment that uh, we need, uh, then uh, it, the government has a role to step in and fill in the gap. So just like the Federal Reserve is the, uh, is the lender of last resort, the government needs to be the employer of last resort in a world where um, uh, market economies left to their own devices don't go far enough. This is particularly germane for, say, the bottom 20%, because we now, and it's, it's a topic we focus on at Center on Budget, we now live in a world where, uh, at least in a country, where anti-poverty policy is predicated on work. And I'm actually okay with that for able-bodied people if the demand is there, if the jobs are there, if the quality of the jobs are there. But absent employment, and this is where I take issue with someone like Paul Ryan who says, you know, just uh, cut them off and they'll go get jobs. That completely ignores the demand side of the equation. So what, what we propose in the book is basically scaling up the TANF subsidized jobs program that I thought was very effective during the Recovery Act. And I can say more about that uh, uh, in Q&A if you want. It's a subsidized jobs program. I'm not talking about sending a bunch of guys, they were mostly guys, into the woods to build a dam. That's not, that's not really what it is anymore, I don't think. I'm talking about uh, uh, subsidized employment. And I think we could scale that up at a, at a, at a, at a low cost with a big bang for the buck. I'm not going to say much about fiscal and monetary policy in the interest of time. That's a thing you could go on all night about. Um, I think the Fed has done, has done good work, but we can talk about that if folks want to. I'll only say this on fiscal policy. Obviously, and we said this earlier, we've been completely wrong-headed about it. Austerity is, uh, to me, just um, uh, completely analogous to medieval leeching in terms of the damage it does and the, and, 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 uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the misperceptions of its usefulness. But uh, you know, there was this paper, and I just, I just reread this, so it's a little fresh in my mind. There's this paper a while ago by um, uh, Larry Summers and Brad DeLong called Fiscal Policy in a Depressed Economy, or something like that. It was a Brookings paper. And they made this argument that at a time like this, fiscal policy actually pays for itself. And I thought it was a little, almost a step too far, kind of laugher curvy ish um, You know, if, if, if you, you can spend money and you kind of get it back through the tax system. But actually, if you work through their paper, it, it, the, the key thing there is something I talked about earlier, this notion of hysteresis. If you can avoid, by doing fiscal policy now, if you can avoid doing this, if not permanent, long-term damage to the economy's growth by helping people get back to work sooner than they would otherwise, the benefits from doing that are very strong, and the costs to not doing it are very steep. So I, I, I'm not saying that fiscal policy is costless, but I don't really get what's wrong with their, with their argument. Well, I have one more before throwing it open, and that's you mentioned two things that people are 
policy makers are too focused on compared to full employment. One is inflation and the other one is the deficit. Too focused too quickly. Why are they so focused on those things and how can we shift the focus to employment? It's a really good question. With inflation, you know, I think part of the issue is, you know, who stands to lose from it and you know, put it crudely, you know, people, lenders, people with money are the ones who stand to lose by inflation. And, you know, that's, I think, why you get this sort of hysteria that, oh my God, we might get inflation. Because, you know, look, none of us want German-style hyperinflation. You know, that's kind of, you know, sitting there in the background that, you know, if we do these policies. But it's close to nuts. I mean, nothing that anyone has on the political agenda is going to get us German-style hyperinflation. Uh, German style hyperinflation because they lost a war. They had to pay huge prep reparations. You do not find examples of countries with healthy political structures. Maybe it's wrong to call ours healthy. It doesn't really call it healthy now. But in any case, a government that's not on the edge of collapse. And you know, my comparisons here are Zimbabwe, the South. You know, just before the end of the Civil War. I mean, th those are the countries that get hyperinflation. You don't have industrialized economies that haven't been hit by war, haven't been hit by natural disaster, or about to collapse as say Yugoslavia did in the 1980s. You do not get hyperinflation. What you can get, the worst case scenario, is a gradual increase of inflation. You know, which again, could certainly be bad over time, but the idea that that will just hit you tomorrow is utterly absurd. So I think this concern with inflation really is, you know, just it's really foolhardy, and I think it stands, it comes from the fact that you have a lot of actors in the economy today that have a lot of power, and basically from their vantage point, things are fine. And I hate to be really crude here, but I think it's appropriate. Corporate profits are at record highs. So from the standpoint, you know, if we're looking at the Fortune 500, we're looking at the fixed the debt people, things are basically fine. You know, and it's not to say these are all bad people and they want to see people suffer, but they themselves are not suffering. So it's easy for them to look out and go, you know, things are basically fine. Boy, if we could just cut Social Security and Medicare, then we could write, you know, long-term budgets would be balanced and surpluses, you know, 20, you know. So for them, there really isn't a problem. So they're concerned to keep inflation from going up. And the problems that, you know, I think everyone here sees pretty clear as day to them, those just aren't an issue. I think the only thing I'd add is that this is a kind of tangentially related to your question, and then we, we, we will uh, open this up. Good. Um, is that I guess I look, I'm steeped in this, and probably many of you are too. One of the, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I find it hard to even really wrap my head around some of the counter arguments about why we should worry about budget deficits right now or inflation right now. And so I pretty quickly go to a similar place of, of Dean, which is there must be a political motivation here. And if you can strangle um, government under the guise of, um, of good economics or strangle, you know, or, or get the Fed uh, to stop help trying to help the economy under the guise of good economics, You'll do so even though you don't really believe it's good economics. You could care less about good economics. You don't even know what good economics are. Um, I think there's a related question which is I, uh, that, that sometimes comes up in this discussion, which is why are you even going into all of this with all your ideas and your five, your five great ideas to, to get to full employment and your path back when the politics are way over here and you're way over there? I mean, what's the point? And I do consider that to be a, a, a relevant challenge. Um, but I, I, I would say that, first of all, um, we're playing a long game here, just like we don't expect inflation to um, uh, uh, take off, uh, uh, start spiraling out of control tomorrow. We don't expect um, Congress to embrace our ideas tomorrow either. Uh, so we, we, you know, we're, play, we're playing a long game. And we believe that to get these ideas into the echo chamber of the, of the DC debate, it, it, it's, it, you've got to start somewhere. Um, it's not inconceivable to me that uh, some number of years from now, getting to full employment could, could be just as important to people. Their hair could be just as much inflamed with the idea of getting to full employment versus uh, uh, lowering the budget deficit. And in the near term, when, one way to see if we're at all successful is I would really like the next candidates for president, I'm being nonpartisan here, but I suspect one side would be far more likely to embrace this than the other, but the next candidates for president have full employment as a plank. On their, uh, on their policy agenda. And I don't think that's outlandish, and it's something that, uh, uh, is, is, that, that, I, that I hope our, our book accomplishes. Yeah. 
I just want to, before you just interrupt the flow here, I just want to make a quick point that I should have said a moment ago in terms of the, the, the budget hawks. One of the things that's been striking to me, I'm saying this because I just wrote a post on it today, if you look at the projections for health care cost growth, those have fallen hugely over the last five years, and that's translated into a huge reduction in the projected cost of Medicare and Medicaid in the budget. Now, if we go back to 2008, I doubt even if we had, you know, Pete Peterson here, he would have suggested larger cuts to Medicare and Medicaid than what we're actually seeing simply because of slower projected growth. Yet their demands have not changed one iota, which I think speaks to the nature of their demands. They're based in gutting these programs, and they have very little to do with some idea of fiscal prudence. Sorry about that. Slightly optimistic end note from Jared and a slightly less optimistic one from Dean. Do we have questions? I'm actually going to circulate this. Oh, okay. I think since World War II, after World War II, it was obvious that it, almost everything that happened was about competition with the Soviets and discrediting socialism. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, we no longer had to show off for the Soviets. And um, just a couple of days ago, I saw a headline about Ukraine repudi repudiating some agreement they thought they were going to make with the EU and embraced Russia. I don't know too much about exactly what happened there, but I wonder if um, Ukraine uh, turning away from Europe and going back to Russia might signal a change in politics here if we have to show off for the Soviets again. Yes, sir. Yeah, let's take a few questions. We're going to take a few questions and then answer them. You know, we'll take another round. Uh, you were beginning to address this in your last, um, in, in what you spoke about last. If, if you were able to drop 435 copies of your book on the House, another 100 on the Senate, one in the White House, and then another 30,000 on K Street, why do we have any reason to suspect that these folks who are in charge of implementing what you would like to see implemented would do it? Uh, I read something a couple of months ago that um, said, you know, sort of the common wisdom is that the Republican Party doesn't want to go back to full employment because they want to do damage to President Obama politically. But uh, what it said was that there's another layer to it, that they think that when, uh, in, when unemployment is high, it allows, it allows the party to uh, stir, up, stir up some sentiment among their base, you know, with anti-immigrant or anti-gay sentiment, that when there's full employment and everything is well and good, it doesn't play as well. Uh, what do, you, do you think that's the case? And if so, how do we get past that? Can I this round? Yeah, that's, let me start. Go ahead. Pick up. Um, the, this, the question in Ukraine, I don't think that's part of the general trend, but I, but I would say, because I, I, I mean the politics, I will claim zero expertise in Ukraine, except to know there's a substantial Russian minority and a lot goes between the Russian minority, which at the moment seems to be the dominant force in Ukrainian politics, and I think that's really what's going on there. But I think there has certainly at times been an effect that because we did feel we have to compete with the Soviets, that it did, I think, often have a positive effect. I think the civil rights movement advanced more quickly than might have otherwise been the case because we were trying to be a model for the world and looked really bad when you had, you know, a large segment of your population was denied basic human rights in a very visible way. It's not that racism went away, but in that, that case it was in law. So, you know, so I think the fact that you had the Soviet Union there that was willing to exploit that, obviously for cynical purposes, but nonetheless, that, that affected our behavior. So in that sense, that we're no longer in that sort of competition, I think does have some negative ramifications. I won't carry that too far, but I think that is certainly part of the story. Um, dropping it on Congress. Um, I'll, I'll be both generous and cynical towards members of uh, you know, Congress. I forget who it was that told me to go, what, what, what's a member of Congress's job? And I you know, started to say, well, you know, they pass laws, blah, blah, blah. They go, how do they lose their job? Well, they lose their job if they don't get reelected. Um, so, I mean, I would love to have every member of Congress and everyone over the White House read our book, but you know, the bottom line is they respond to political force. And right now, they don't feel that. 
you know, they'll feel that about deficit reduction, and part of the, partly it's the role the media plays. You know, you have the Washington Post jumping on, ah, what about the grand bargain? How come you're not blah, blah, blah? You're not serious. You're not blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and they should feel that the other way, and they don't feel that now. And when they do feel that, I think that'll change their behavior. So, you know, yeah, I would love to have the members, perhaps more importantly, their staffers read it, and I think a few of them will. But I think the important thing is that they feel the pressure, and for the most part, they're not feeling that now. Um, the last question, what Republican tactics, I don't know. I mean, you have a lot of nuttiness there. I mean, I'm sure you all saw that, uh, the, you know, it came out, the real reason that President Obama did the deal with Iran was to distract everyone from, from Obamacare's disaster. Um, you know, I, I really can't say. I, I mean, anything is possible, and obviously there's a range of views there. I mean, some, some of them obviously are reasonable people, but some of them may think, oh, yeah, if we just keep unemployment really high, then they'll keep the pot boiling and... So I, I, I can't really say, I, you know, I don't know what the majority of you is there. I'll just add on that last point. Um, it was very notable to me that uh, in the latter 90s, when the unemployment rate uh, fell to full employment, the last time we really had that kind of an economy uh, uh, here, and wages at the 20th percentile, low wages, were rising at the rate of productivity for a number of years, something that hadn't happened before or since, since I've been looking at this sort of thing, uh, at a period where immigration flows were quite steep, in fact, steeper than they are now. And we, we, we talked about this in our, in our first book. Uh, and so one of the things that your question made me think of is that, you know, yeah, I mean, obviously, but it is worth saying that there is just a lot less hostility towards immigrants when, uh, when you're, when you're at, at full employment. And I think it's, I, I think uh, in terms of uh, public support, it's much tougher to um, make those kinds of, uh, uh, to make progressive gains in those kinds of policies in a climate like this one, even though interestingly, uh, a majority still would like to see, uh, from recent polling, a majority would like to see a path to citizenship. I think there's just one, a, a relative, remember, the folks here are already here, so they're not putting any downward, new downward pressure on the unemployment. I'm sorry, so let's take some more questions. Oh. <laughs> um, sort of capitalizing on the general air of cynicism in the room regarding the policy making failures of Congress. Um, you know, ever since Acorn stole the election for, for President Obama, uh, the, the policy making body hasn't functioned, but is there some um, discretionary tool outside of Congress that? that could be amenable to some sort of progressive application of, of policy making. For example, could Janet Yellen, Arne Duncan, and uh, uh, Jack Lew do something through some sort of transfer accounting to use uh, the QE to pay off student loans? Or could Chuck Hagel use part of the defense discretionary budget to fund his own sort of national defense education initiative? Is that something we could do, and then instead of buying 30,000 books, maybe we just buy like five or six. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. So this actually plays off the guy's question right over there. Um, I was going to say probably with Congress completely ground to a halt, like one of the few silver linings, I think, over the last year or two has been the Federal Reserve and its willingness to continue QE. And now with Janet Yellen taking over and also filibuster reform, hopefully opening up, a, like making a bit more political space for more dovish uh, nominations to the FOMC. Um, I mean, how much potential do you think there is at the Federal Reserve specifically for getting some movement on this? I mean, at least through continuing QE uh, and maybe something crazier like, you know, a higher inflation target or even nominal GDP targeting. Um, and as Dean mentioned, um, lowering the value of the dollar. One more and then we'll take that round. How about something really basic like with the labor management dynamic? If you've got um, <coughs> high unemployment, you don't have to pay high wages, you don't have to fight with unions on um, what your business is or isn't going to do, it's kind of a, con a control, it's, it's an environment where management has much more control over their employees. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll start. Um, policies outside of Congress, um, yeah, the, the, actually, the, the, maybe I can combine the, the first two. 
Um, I don't know about this uh, cabal of, um, of Arne Duncan and, uh, and those guys. Um, I do know that the Federal Reserve actually, and, and Dean, correct me if you disagree, um, uh, the Federal Reserve actually has pretty strict restrictions on the kinds of lending it can do. Um, it can, of course, buy treasuries, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, it can buy mortgages, right? Well, it's buying mortgage-backed securities from the, uh, from the agencies, from, um, uh, from the agencies under conservatorship right now, Fannie and Freddie, the GSEs. So um, in the past, when people have asked the Fed, why can't you, for example, print money to support investment in local infrastructure, Bernanke himself has said, um, that's just not, uh, you know, our bylaws would prohibit that. So I'm not sure how far you can get with that. I do think you're on the right track, though. And I think that um, one of the things about the nuclear option seems to me, anyway, I haven't thought this through that carefully, but seems to me a calculation that says, well, look, the nuclear option is going to so piss off Republicans that they're not going to pass anything no matter what, but they're already we're not going to pass anything no matter what. So, you know, maybe we can do some, some stuff with, with the majority in the Senate. And, and um, that takes you to uh, the question about the Federal Reserve and appointing some uh, uh, dumbish folks on the FOMC. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that's, that's plausible. I don't, I don't know that that, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how big a deal that is, I guess, is, is where I'm coming from. Um, because, and I, I, I've written recently about some of the limitations of the Federal Reserve. I think they're doing a, a lot. I think they could do a bit more, but I think they're doing a lot. I think they've been the one agency in town that's actually been targeting unemployment for a really long time. So I give them a ton of credit in, in, in my work and, and, and in my, uh, in my speaking because uh, I very much appreciate what they're trying to do, but they can't do it by themselves. And Bernanke himself has said, we can sort of set the table with low interest rates, but we can't essentially uh, uh, get the demand side of the equation going such that people take advantage of the low rates. It's sort of like they're setting the table at the restaurant, but they can't get people to come in and eat if there's a demand deficiency. Um, as far as a higher inflation target, you might say, well, a higher inflation target would do it. There, I think the Fed has made a judgment that they don't want to go there. They've been quite clear about keeping inflation well anchored at around 2%, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, count on that. Um, I think there are some ideas that you could do on the policy side that the president could do by regulation, executive order. Um, uh, Ross Eisenberg, an EPI uh, 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 vice president, recently wrote a piece about changes to overtime rules that would help folks. Um, Dean, why don't you talk about labor, labor management cl uh, climate? Yeah, let me say a couple things about first going back to the Fed. I, I think it would be interesting, and you know, you'd have to see how the politics shape shape out shake out on this with, with Yellen, and I certainly wouldn't blame her for not saying anything until she actually gives Fed chair. But you know, if you could go the route of trying to target a higher rate of inflation, you know, I think that would be very beneficial. And the model here uh, in Japan, uh, their Prime Minister Shinzo Abe actually did explicitly target a higher rate of inflation at that point. Uh, Japan actually had a uh, modest rate of deflation, and they said they're going to have a 2% two, 2 inflation target. And he, they took over the central bank just in March of last year, so they're this year, I should say. So it's a relatively new policy. But it seems, you know, and it's still early, but it seems that has turned around uh, their deflation, so prices seem to be rising modestly. And just to be clear why that's good, because I write this on my blog, and I have all these people saying, oh, you want to screw workers, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe I do, but, you know, the, the real story here is that you know, if you have a higher rate of inflation, businesses, when they invest, they're always looking forward. So, you know, if you're thinking of a factory, you know, a firm's building a factory, getting new equipment, you're spending the money today. They're going to sell the stuff over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Same thing with software, whatever it might be. They're going to get back their revenue stream over the next 5, 10, 15 years. If they think prices are higher, then it makes more sense to invest today. So that's the real logic of it. So it's not, uh, it's not some grand conspiracy. Maybe some people see it that way, but it's not a grand conspiracy to screw workers, get wages down. The point is it gives firms more incentive to invest. So I would be interested to see. The important thing to keep in mind is that even if Janet Yellen were sitting here to agree with us 100%, she can't do it unilaterally. She has to bring along the Open Market Committee, 12 members. She has to get a majority. I have no idea where that sits right now. Um, so that, that's where, where that would have to go. But I'd love, love to see it. But well, let me just say quickly, I mean, I, I have a PhD in, in Janet Yellen. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, I, don't, I, can't speak to, I, I just have read her really, really carefully. And if you look at her most recent work, which I find pretty innovative, it's this whole thing called optimal control theory. And one of the, thing, one of the things it does is it, it suggests that 
To get to full employment, here are the path, uh, here are the paths of the relevant variables that you invoke when you get to full employment. And here is how long interest rates are going to have to stay low, and here's the path of inflation, and here's the path of unemployment. And her inflationary path in this um, set of simulations she does ticks above 2% for a little while, like it goes to two and a quarter before it gets back down to two. And oh my god, the people who saw that were like amazed that, that, that this 2% inflation target isn't a ceiling, an inviolate ceiling that may never be violated. And she had to explain to the world why um, in her simulations you actually go over it a bit before you come back down to it. So I, I agree with what Dean said, and I, I don't know what goes in the actual minds of, of, of people. Uh, I, don't, I don't claim to have, you know, I'm not a mind reader. But I do think the anchoring at 2% is very big for them. Listen, quickly, on the labor management climate, the only thing I'll say about that, it's a great question. We haven't talked enough about the role of unions in, uh, in, in this context. And, and, and of course, uh, their loss has been very much associated with, with rising inequality and less pressure on full employment. Um, but one thing we, we have noted, and that's again, gets back to the cover, as Dean described it earlier, is that the pressure from full employment, where employers have to bid up wages and even benefits to get and keep the workers they need elsewhere, uh, 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 unless the, otherwise they don't do that, they don't bid up compensation to get the workers they need, they're going to leave profits on the table. That's the best negotiating tool I've seen in a country with a private sector unionization rate at 6%. One of the points, you know, when you look at the economy today, one of the things that really has been striking to me, some of you may have seen this in Tennessee, they have a Volkswagen plant, and Volkswagen, you know, it's a German company. In Germany, if you, you affirm more than 50 workers, they have co-determination. There's a workers' body that has uh, not quite equal say, but near equal say with the shareholders. And Volkswagen was saying, okay, well, we do this everywhere, because they operate in other countries as well, not just the United States. They operate in many countries around the world. So everywhere, they have, you know, a workers' uh, a workers' council. So they were saying, okay, we're setting up this plant in Germany, in uh, Tennessee, we're going to have a workers' council here. And this created this uproar there. The Chamber of Commerce is up in arms. One of their senators is a corker who's been yeah. screaming about it. You know, he sent them a letter saying you're going to totally disrupt, you know, labor management relations in Tennessee. You just go, what's going on here? I thought this was a market economy. You know, that, that <laughs> here it is, a company decides this is the way we run our, our businesses. And they're telling you, oh no, you can't do that. This is Tennessee. You got to do it our way. <laughs> so it's it's kind of striking. It just speaks to this that you know here you have a company that has decided this is the way they operate. They bring workers in. They want to get their input. And here you have the, the other employers are saying, oh no no no, we we don't treat our workers that way because they get the wrong ideas. <laughs> More questions. So the, the, the bad news is that we've run out of time for questions in this forum. The good news is that these guys are sticking around to sign books and to also take your questions and have a chat. Um, thanks very much. Thanks to Chai Chi Hong. Just put in one more plug because we've got, got a fantastic blurb from Robert Reich, a gem of a book explaining why full employment is so important and how it can be achieved. Mandatory reading for every concerned citizen. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.